Jean Schnupp here. Welcome to another of the new Savvy Sightseer video vacation series. Today, our travels will take you through most of Long Island from the Nassau Queens border all the way to the tip of Montauk Point. This one is quite a mix. On this trip, you might satisfy your curiosity about something you passed on a road. You'll definitely learn some very interesting history, and you'll find a few things just to smile about. Hey, Long Island, what's up with that? We'll stop and take a second look at 26 sites, memorials, and curiosities along highways and side streets. Maybe you've been out to the Montauk Lighthouse, but didn't give any thought to the benign enough looking sign for Camp Hero. Or you gazed quizzically at a gravestone in the parking lot of the Long Island Railroad in Merrick, but kept on going. Here's where you will pause to investigate and find out why these came to be there, at least in most cases. This program and the pictures were all done in the summer of 2020. It was another great way to get out and about while still social distancing and staying in the car's air conditioning on those really hot and humid days of July and August. Almost all can be seen from the comfort of your car. A few, though, do require a little walkabout, but in some very lovely parks. If you're not familiar with some of the town names, you can find a link to an interactive map of the sites in this program on my website. The address for that is posted at the end of the video. I'm sure there are many more of these roadside question marks. These are just the ones I found while driving around or heard about from others and could fit in a 30 minute video. I'll keep exploring though. Maybe I'll find enough for a sequel. So let's hit the road now together for a trip like no other. These teepees at Prosser Pines in Middle Island are what prompted the title for this program. I came across them when I was walking through the preserve and wondered why they were there and who built them. They're quite tall and surprisingly roomy inside. I hit the internet to find out more. In the process, I learned a lot about the park. The soaring white pines started as seedlings from Quebec that were planted by a British officer in 1759. He had been awarded 300 acres in Middle Island for his role in the French and Indian War. In 1889, a descendant sold 240 of the acres to Thomas Prosser. Suffolk County bought the land in 1967 and named it Prosser Pines Nature Preserve, thereby protecting the oldest surviving white pine plantation on the eastern seaboard. As for the cluster of teepees, well, what's up with them? No one, not even the Suffolk County Parks Department, could tell me why they are there or who built them. You have to give people credit for creativity during the pandemic. This fisherman topiary is certainly doing his part to stop the spread at a nursery in Amagansett. Amid the stately mansions of Watermill, you find historic charm and a mix of farms, woodlands, and multi-million dollar estates secluded behind oversized evergreens, and a property that at first seems completely incongruous with its setting. Yet, with closer examination, it's apparent it is very much compatible with its surroundings. This elliptical house was the home of artist Nova Papa, who designed and built it as a sculpture to live in. Nova had undertaken an arduous month-long journey in 1966 to escape communist Romania. He spent many hours on a ship deck thinking about the waves, curves, and undulations that make up natural order, which would later be reflected in his art. He said his goal was to create a dreamlike conversation between art, nature, and the cosmos. He eventually gravitated to Watermill in 1986, where he set up a studio and built the unusual 2,800 square foot home. I wanted this house to have a soul, he said. On an adjoining 95 acre farm, Nova established the Ark Project with galleries, museum spaces, and a vast sculpture park where he could express his concept of integral art. That's a melding of a sculpture, painting, architecture, and philosophy. More than 70 of his steel structures, some 30 feet tall, are spread out on the property. A few with celestial names like Orion, pictured in the lower left corner. Above it is multiverses, I believe as opposed to just one universe. On the right of the screen are simply named ones, the totem towers with the red check in the distance. Nova said steel was his favorite medium, contending it has an elemental cosmic quality. Iron is the skeleton of the stars, he noted, adding he enjoyed the challenge of taking a raw, resistant, independent, and proud material and making it vibrate with human spirit. 
Nova passed away in 2009, but his ARC project continues, run by his partners. The unusual sculpture park sometimes even hosts charity events or provides a distinctive backdrop for weddings. No matter where you go on Long Island, you are never far from water, and the importance of related industries are everywhere, like the Bayman statue in Babylon. The seven-foot-tall bronze sculpture is a reminder of and tribute to the pivotal role of the Great South Bay in the economy and culture of the island. In the 1970s, clamming was a thriving business, with thousands of licensed clammers plying the local waters, dressed much as this man, in waders with tongs. It was the prolific catch that originally drew settlers to Long Island's South Shore in the 1600s. By the early 1900s, more than two million bushels of clams collected from the bay were sold both locally and internationally. During the industry's heyday, an estimated two-thirds of the world's hard-shelled clams came out of our bay, which also produced scallops, oysters, eel, and other fish. That fabulous output, though, was bound to deplete, and natural as well as man-made factors sharply reduced the harvest, up to 60% by the mid-1980s. Efforts are underway to rebuild the clam population, but production is not ever expected to return to its peak. The Bayman, who made his debut across from Argyle Lake in 2018, stands tall and proud of the area's seafaring heritage. On the North Shore, where the Long Island Sound stretches between New York and Connecticut, homage is paid to another group who made their living from the sea. In Port Jefferson, at the Harbor Front Park, Four rugged men hoist the bones of a 20-foot schooner near where Bale's shipbuilders, established in 1835, once stood. In the 19th century, with 40% of the county's total production, Port Jefferson was the leading shipbuilding center in Suffolk County and one of the largest boat builders in New York outside of the Brooklyn Navy Yard. The village's memorial to its maritime heritage, called the Landmark Sculpture, was unveiled in 2004. From whales to shellfish to seahorses, Long Island's waters do seem to cover all forms of marine life. Yes, even seahorses, the northern lined version, are actually native to the waters of Long Island, and in Wantua, this playful looking fish even has its own memorial, and in this case, a nickname, Sea Biscuit, which was given to him by a Chamber of Commerce member when it was erected in 2000. The seahorse is the Chamber's logo and was also a favorite of Robert Moses who created Wantor's most famous playground, Jones Beach State Park. He had chosen the seahorse as the emblem for the beach, which he began turning in the late 1920s from an inaccessible flood-prone strip of land into the nation's first fully planned seaside recreation area. Named for Major Thomas Jones, a British privateer who originally owned about 6,000 acres of land in what is now Nassau County, the park covers just over 2,400 acres and stretches along six and a half miles of the Atlantic Ocean. Unfortunately, the seahorse was added to the World Conservation Union's Endangered Species list in 2017, but local environmental groups are working to restore its diminished natural habitat so that these small fish will again thrive off Long Island's coast. Meanwhile, Sea Biscuit stands regally in Triangle Park as a tribute to the seashore and its inhabitants. A solemn reminder that the seashore is not always a place to frolic on the beach can be found in Lindenhurst, with an inscription that reads, When Mother Nature was at its worst, human nature was at its best. This boulder shows how high the sea poured into the town during Superstorm Sandy in 2012, while at the same time pays tribute to a grassroots volunteer effort to help residents devastated by the hurricane. Camp Bulldog, as the humanitarian group came to be known, had operated a meal and supply station on this spot for six months after the storm hit. The simplicity of this pinnacle, rising above headstones around it in the center of Rockville Cemetery in Lindrick, contradicts its complex significance. The Bristol and Mexico Monument atop the Mariner's Burial Ground marks a mass grave of unclaimed bodies of immigrants, mainly English and I Irish, who were tragically lost off the south shore of Nassau County in the 1830s, and the start of pivotal changes in U.S. maritime law. The 139 crew and passengers interred there had been among 267 who were traveling on American ships, the Bristol and the Mexico, to New York from Liverpool, England. The 18-foot marble obelisk and, and blocks it stands on were carved upstate at the quarries in Ossining, 
then known as the village of Sing Sing, from a Native American phrase that means stone on stone. The tragedies, just five weeks apart, highlighted significant issues regarding the region's maritime procedures. The Bristol, founded 400 yards off of Far Rockaway Beach in November of 1836, when New York's harbor pilots were not at their posts to guide the ship in. She wrecked when hitting a sandbar. Most on board drowned instantly. The Mexico, likewise, was abandoned by the harbor pilots who were reportedly out celebrating on that New Year's Eve. She broke apart amid a raging storm, while the captain and some crew fled in lifeboats. Most of the passengers froze to death on her decks just 200 yards off the coast of Long Beach. Long Island poet Walt Whitman had been a young school teacher in nearby Babylon at the time and wrote of the incident in The Sleepers. I hear the howls of dismay. They grow fainter and fainter. The twin maritime catastrophes led to major governmental action. A plaque at the monument explains, the corrupt harbor pilot's monopoly was abolished by federal legislation. The Ambrose Lighthouse lightship was stationed in New York Harbor to guard the shipping channel and the U.S. Treasury also ordered two ships to be on rescue patrol in the waters off Long Island and New Jersey. And Rainer Smith, who rescued the eight fleeing crew of the Mexico, was appointed, it says, as the first lighthouse keeper to have rescue responsibility included in his duties. All of these actions contributed to the development of divisions of the United States Coast Guard. In another sad tale of loss on the waters, we come to this Indian memorial. It is one that I have a special affinity for. Meet Native American Princess Tuscawanta of the Algonquin tribe, who stands nobly on the south shore of Lake Ronkonkoma. The lake name is believed to be an Americanized version of the Algonquin term for a fishing pool. I first became acquainted with the princess back in 1989 when I was a local reporter and wrote about plans being floated for a tribute to her. In December of 2017, a sculpture did finally get underway prompted by the death of an historic tree in 2015. The European Copper Beach had been brought to America in 1820 by a local family to honor the bicentennial of the Pilgrims landing at, Pilgrim, at Plymouth Rock. It was designated an historic landmark by Suffolk County in 2012. The landowner wanted it somehow preserved, so she turned to artist, artist Todd Arnett, who had a vision for the majestic tree that involved a chainsaw definitely not to reduce it to firewood. Instead, the Copper Beach will continue to be an integral part of the Hamlet's history, re-emerging as a legendary figure. When finished, the 32-foot tall sculpture will also reflect a gruesome tale that persists to this day of the Lady of the Lake who periodically claims a lover in her loneliness. Hundreds of drownings at the lake, Long Island's largest and deepest, have been blamed on a sad princess. Legend has it her father had forbidden her to marry her white lover. According to one version, for seven long years, she used the lake as a conduit to pass messages via an underground stream to her man miles away on the Kinequat River. She ultimately set out on a canoe and was found dead floating down the river the next day. The artist doesn't have any idea when his tribute will be finished since he only works on it in his spare time, but hopes it will rewrite the princess's story of intrigue by appeasing her and ending her curse, and the drownings. Can't get to Egypt to view the Great Sphinx of Giza? Not a problem. We have a scaled down version with a slightly more fanciful expression than the original right in Bayport. The 10 foot, 45 ton concrete sculpture is about one seventh the height of the real Sphinx and is not nearly as old. This one is traced back to the early 1900s when Captain Will Graham built an attraction for his Anchorage Inn in Blue Point. It spent some time at a local gas station after the inn burned down in 1928 and ultimately found a home at the Fontana Cement Company in Bayport, where the owners restored it and put it on display. Contradicting Graham's playful climbing challenge, current owners forbid doing so. A skilled sculptor and mar marble worker, Graham had arrived in America from Belfast, Ireland in 1888 and opened the inn nearly a decade later. Reportedly, he was quite a marketer and a promoter, and even staged a bullfight at the inn, drawing 2,000 spectators. Among the inn's more famous clientele were said to be Theodore Roosevelt, Mary Pickford, and Douglas Fairbanks. If you are looking for something that is much, much larger than life, then Flanders has a treat for you. The simply named Big Duck is just that, 
a roadside architecture in the shape of a 20-foot tall waterfowl. In another bit of creative marketing, Riverhead duck farmer Martin Moore commissioned local masons in 1931 to create this 10-ton attention-grabbing concrete and wooden shop from which he could sell ducks and eggs. Today, the shop with eyes made from Ford Model T taillights is listed on the National Register of Historic Places. And while it's owned by Suffolk County, the not-for-profit organization Friends of the Big Duck operated as a gift and tourism center. Driving along Montauk Highway in West Hampton, the trees and brush suddenly give way, and in a clearing is a concrete castle guarded by two 12-foot-tall fencing musketeers. Definitely not what you would expect to find coming around the bend. Built in 1903, it was originally the pottery studio of famed sculptor Theophilus Brower, whose unique pottery can even be seen in the Smithsonian, while some of his sculptures can be spotted around the island. The castle, modeled after ones he'd seen in Seville, Spain, earned the disdain of local reviewers, who referred to it as the most bizarre human creation on all Long Island, and a building out of place in period and style. Today, though, it is a favorite site. Brower had decorated the 28-acre lot, known as Pinewald Park, with fanciful sculptures. Several are still visible for, from the road, including a fairy, a rearing horse, and a golden lion. The building housing his kiln later became a popular Italian restaurant when the property was bought by the Basso family in the late 1920s. Today, a baker has set up shop in the castle itself. I lived in Nassau County for several years and often passed the sand pits of Port Washington, not paying them much attention, which is the theme of this program. When I heard a monument was installed there in 2011, I did give the place some thought and learned about its amazing role in the development of Manhattan. The Sand Miners Monument pays tribute to the thousands of laborers, largely Italian immigrants, who harvested the sand there, a unique mixture of grains perfect for making concrete. Port Washington's sand banks, the largest east of the Mississippi, led to a lucrative sand mining industry for over a hundred years and became Nassau County's largest business. Movie companies used the sand canyons for films like The Pearls of Pauline or as stand-ins for western desert scenes. The Chrysler and Empire State Buildings, Tunnels, Queensboro Bridge, FDR Drive, West Side Highway, and more, up to an estimated 90% of New York City's infrastructure, were all built with Port Washington sand. At the industry's peak, 50 barges a day sailed out of Hempstead Harbor, filled with local sand and gravel. Reportedly from the first load, mined in 1865 until the last in 1989, more than 140 million yards of sand were delivered from Port Washington to New York City. Dwindling resources and mounting environmental and political pressures led to the demise of the industry. Now the town-owned land is part brush, part golf course, and part tribute to those who built a city. Long Island railroad cars, tracks, and station houses are generally not unusual sites in either Nassau or Suffolk County, except when they're in the middle of a residential and park area, and boarding the car will get you nowhere fast. Such is the case with the old Wantor train station, now the cornerstone of the Wantor Museum Complex on Wantor Avenue. The Victorian era indoor waiting room and ticket office had served the community traveling along the Penn Station to Montauk line for more than 80 years, when it was deemed outdated and slated for demolition. The Wantor Preservation Society was hurriedly formed in 1965 to prevent the loss of the beautiful old structure, spurred on by the disturbing modernization of Penn Station that was largely hailed as a miscarriage of architectural justice just two years earlier. The Society succeeded in moving their historic building about a half mile north to its new home adjacent to Wantor Woods. The station's interior was restored to circa 1904 when it was operated by the first woman ticket master. Forever just entering the station is the Jamaica, once a luxury first-class car built in 1912. It faced a similar fate as the station house in 1968 when it too was rescued from demolition by the society. The 80-foot long Jamaica is the last remaining of the parlor cars. It was considered state-of-the-art when it was built in the early 20th century with direct current electricity, a solarium, cooking facilities, and ice-filled air conditioning. When the museum is open, you can step aboard for a look at luxury from a bygone era. 
One passenger who may have hopped aboard the Jamaica was of the four-legged variety. He had a lifetime pass to ride the rails at will on his own, issued by no less than the LIRR president himself. The story goes that Roxy had been given over to a train attendant to hold for a pretty lady with a blue parasol in 1901 who was on her way from Long Island City to Roslyn. She was never seen again. Roxy was then taken in by a train employee and became the LIRR's mascot. He traveled every line, dined with different workers, and was considered a good luck charm if he chose your car for a ride. He was even seen wandering a newly opened Penn Station in 1910. Roxy was so popular he raided his own postcard. His most talked about exploit, though, was the time he managed to hole up in Theodore Roosevelt's car on one of the president's trips to his Oyster Bay estate. Mr. Roosevelt, known for his love of animals, happily spent the trip with Roxy as his companion. After more than a decade roaming the rails, Roxy passed away quietly at the Merrick Station on the railroad's South Shore Line in 1914. A symbol of his enduring popularity among staff and commuters alike can be found in a cutaway of the parking lot, where surrounded by tended bushes, his headstone stands, donated by a group of women commuters in 1915. His story is even detailed by Heather Hill Wetherington and beautifully illustrated by Bill Farnsworth in Miles of Smiles, The Story of Roxy, the LIRR Dog, a children's book available for checkout at local libraries. Another dog laid to rest on Long Island with a colorful past and presidential partner is Checkers, Richard Nixon's pet pooch. The Cocker Spaniel became a household name in 1952 when Nixon was Dwight D. Eisenhower's VP nominee. A controversy had erupted over gifts Nixon received. Checkers may have been an unlawful gift, but he is a gift we intend to keep, Nixon asserted at the time. The puppy's cuteness and an anecdotal story about a young Trisha Nixon naming him endeared him to the American people. According to Bidewey, the Wantua Pet Cemetery where Checkers was laid to rest, his grave is visited often and trinkets are left on his headstone. Bidewey, which means stay a while in Scottish, was founded in New York City in 1903 as one of America's first no-kill rescues. Operations were expanded to Wantour in 1915 with the first interment at the Pet Memorial Park conducted the following year. Although Nixon never lived on Long Island, he was partner in a New York City law firm when Checkers died in 1964. And since Bidewey was nearby, large and well-known, it was chosen for the famous canine's burial. While Checkers is possibly the most celebrated of the 58,000 animals interred at the 12-acre cemetery, he is not the most unusual. Others include Augustine, a four-foot Cayman alligator, and Speedbump, a giant tortoise that weighed in at 125 pounds, and Gary the grasshopper, buried by the family of an entomologist. While we're on the topic of graveyards, here is one of the most unusual I've come across. The property has quite a spot in history. In the town of Comac, bordered by busy Route 25 at one time, it wasn't cars and trucks rushing past the headstones. It was aircraft taking off from runways around it. The Burr Cemetery, a family plot on a piece of farmland, was primarily used between 1851 and 1878 and reportedly includes descendants of Aaron Burr, an American founding father and third vice president of the U.S. In 1918, the Army cleared the 90-acre land for an aviation camp called Brindley Field for the 211th Aero Squadron to conduct advanced airplane training. It served as a satellite of Mitchell Field in Garden City and was the last training field for flyers before they went off to France. The land was converted back to farmland after World War I. In the 1950s, there was another momentous change to the area surrounding the graveyard. A shopping center sprung up around it. Many Home Depot, Staples, and Old Navy customers heading straight for the stores probably don't even notice the historic graveyard. I have to admit, I was one of them. It is believed to be the only 19th century graveyard in the United States located in a Home Depot parking lot. A volunteer board of trustees maintains the grounds. In front of the Eastport Elementary School on Montauk Highway is another Theophilus Brower sculpture, which was installed in 1922. The artist had used his son, Roger, as the model for the globe-strutting doughboy, a statue of an American World War I soldier standing on a globe with one foot on North America and other planted in Europe. During the war, Roger had been part of a pilot program, the Students' Army Training Corps, 
stationed at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in late 1918. It was planned as a way to speed up training soldiers for war. They would take college courses and simultaneously train for the military. Clearly, creative thinking ran in this family. In 1956, the MIT alum patented a plan for revolutionary golf club, one that adjusted to replace a whole bag of clubs. Nearby, in East Mariches, is yet another of Brower's work. Very colorful. This one is an eagle, and it, too, honors World War I military. When it was sculpted in 1923, its 20-foot wingspan was the largest for a carved eagle in the world. The plaque on the monument, designed as a Congressional Medal of Honor, names locals who had died during the war. The impressive 15-foot tall eagle was commissioned as a grand entrance to the East Mariches School. Eventually, the old school was torn down and replaced by a medical center. But today, the eagle is still vigilantly guarding the globe on the same spot where Brower had carved him almost 100 years ago. This fierce-looking eagle dares anyone to try to move him from his perch alongside the Long Island Railroad station at Hicksville. He is one of the few remaining pink granite sculptures that once graced the facade of the Penn Station's entrance in Manhattan when it opened in 1910. By 1963, the building was slated for demolition to make way for Madison Square Garden to be built above the train station. When Hicksville High School Latin teacher Samuel A. Goldberg learned the figures were available, he set about creating a project for his Latin club students to salvage one. The eagles had originally been modeled after those adorning a third century Roman emperor's bass. The 5,700 pound sculpture was relocated to its current spot and dedicated in 1965 as the Goldberg Eagle. A plaque installed on its base reads in both English and Latin, a pithy observation and warning composed by his students. A Roman eagle, once urban, is now in Hicksville, quite suburban, and adds, heed the past in planning the future. Looking anything but fierce is this cheery snowman in Southampton. He was built in 2000 and aptly named Mr. Millennium, though spelled with one N, different from the turn of the century spelling. I'm not exactly sure why he is standing there on the side of Sandy Hollow Road, but his jolly presence gave a cooling sense on a very hot summer day. To find a whole bunch of oddities in one spot, a visit to a special shop in Southampton is the place to go. It's been listed with a variety of names, including Yesterday's Treasures and Behind the Fence, but whatever name it goes by, unusual, is the best way to describe its inventory. Where else could you find a 200-pound fiberglass replica of the famous 800-year-old stone sculpture found on East Island, sitting between a nearly 17-foot-tall sunflower and a 7-foot-tall ostrich? There's a herd of dinosaurs, another of cows, a roadside Buddha, and my favorite, the boozy chimp. There's no monkey business that went on here at Nikola Tesla's laboratory in Shoreham. Despite having a car named for him, many people are not all that familiar with Tesla, whose genius was largely overshadowed by his more media and business savvy competitor, Thomas Edison, for whom he'd worked when he'd first arrived in New York in 1884. At his laboratory, built in 1901, the Serbian-born engineer and physicist toiled with generating a global wireless system for communication and power transfer, a bizarre concept at the time, but one we take for granted today, 120 years later. He named the former 200-acre potato farm Wardenclyffe after its previous owner, James Warden. Tesla is best known for inventing the first alternating current motor, but he also experimented with x-rays and technically beat Guglielmo Marconi in developing radio communication. Together with George Westinghouse, he lit up the 1891 World's Fair in Chicago. They also partnered to install AC generators at Niagara Falls, creating the first modern power station in 1896. To build his Wardenclyffe lab, Tesla secured backing from financier J.P. Morgan. Key to his planned global communications network was a 187-foot-tall tower. The project ran into financial difficulties, though, and in 1917, the tower was demolished and land transferred to pay some of de Tesla's debts. A replica of the tower stands on the southwest portion of the estate. Tesla eventually moved to the New Yorker Hotel in Manhattan, where he died virtually penniless on January 7, 1943. In 2013, on the 70th anniversary of his death, 
the president of Serbia traveled to Shoram and unveiled this bronze statue of Tesla, a gift from the People's Republic of Serbia. Wardenclyffe is owned by a nonprofit organization which has worked to clean up and restore the site. Their efforts were supported in 2014 by billionaire Elon Musk, CEO of the car maker Tesla, who reportedly donated a million dollars. The group had planned to open a science center in 2020, but COVID-19 put the brakes on that. However, the pandemic did not stop virtual programs from being offered on the center's website, nor the premiere release of the movie Tesla, starring Ethan Hawke. A socially distant, outdoor advanced screening of the movie was held at Wardenclyffe on July 11, 2020, the anniversary of the scientist's birth date. At the very eastern end of Long Island Southwark is a beautiful park called Camp Hero, where experiments of a different kind were believed to have been conducted. Set amid 755 acres, the state park was named for Major General Andrew Hero Jr., commander of a coastal artillery. There you can wander the paths through the forest, stand on bluffs with stunning views of the Atlantic Ocean. You can ride a bike or you can hike, but what you cannot do is ignore the menacing do not enter and danger falling objects signs. Commissioned by the U.S. Army in 1942, the pastoral park at one time had inviting cottages and even a church. At least that's what they appeared to be, a lovely seaside fishing village. But appearances were certainly deceptive, and it was in reality a coastal defense station shrouded in secrecy, peopled by 600 enlisted men and 27 officers, all looking to thwart possible German attacks. The buildings had artificial wood siding and painted on windows. There were, of course, barracks. In the building in the lower left-hand corner of this scene, here was actually a bowling alley. And that one on the right looked sort of like a church, but that was the gymnasium. Huge batteries like this were strung around the 415-acre part of the park that comprised the camp. The 600-foot-long reinforced concrete bunker housed two 16-inch guns, each capable of firing a 2,240-pound armor-piercing shell more than 25 miles at approaching German ships. The camp was finally demilitarized in 1949, but it wasn't vacant for long. Soon after, in 1951, the U.S. Air Force moved into the Montauk Point camp and set up its first radar station to identify potential surprise attacks by Soviets during the Cold War. In 1960, they installed a giant radar tower, which remained in service until 1980. It was the military's most sophisticated system in its day and could detect up incoming missiles up to 200 miles away. The 120-foot-wide, 70-ton structure still looms today, towering ominously above trees and buildings. Its very presence in the area had residents on edge, and stories of odd occurrences started spreading. People reported that when the radar tower would rotate, animals would act out, electronic equipment would malfunction, and people would get headaches and nightmares. Rumors have persisted that at various stages, perhaps even to the current day, clandestine government and military projects have been conducted here, even after it was officially closed in 1982. A book, The Montauk Project, Experiments in Time, was published in 1992 and laid out a reportedly first-hand history of kidnapping, telepathy experiments, and people zipping around to other times and dimensions at the camp. There have been movies and documenta documentaries said to be based on the camp about sordid and frightening activities, such as the kind that fuel conspiracy theories, including Netflix's series Stranger Things. Indeed, even on a bright sunny day, looking up and seeing that steel behemoth towering above can send shivers down the spine. On a more benign note, the Stargazer is a 70-foot-tall steel and plywood structure that is a welcoming sight for those trekking out east. It's a deer gazing up at the sky that had initially been commissioned by the Animal Rescue Fund as a proposed entrance to its shelter in Wainscott, but it ended up being banned by the town because of its immense size. A farmer came to its rescue in 1991, and the Stargazer was moved to the grounds of his sod farm in Manorville. It might take some viewers a second to focus on the structure, but if you start with the oval cutout and see it as the deer's eye, it's easier to recognize his ear and antler, and then the antler in his mouth arching downward to the ground becomes apparent. According to the art artist, it represents the connection of the above to the below, 
and a conscious relationship to the universe. One of the concerns voiced about the stargazer's size and initial plan to erect it at the animal shelter was that it might have been distracting and so dangerous for pilots landing at a small nearby airport in East Hampton. It was not a concern for the walking figure at Gabreski Airport, though, in West Hampton. She's less than half the stargazer's size, coming in at about 30 feet tall. That's not to say there were no objections to her arrival in 2014. She was commissioned by the developers of an industrial park on previously vacant county owned land at the airport. Some residents likened her to olive oil of Popeye, others to Lucy from Peanuts. Harshest of all, perhaps, was one local's critique. It looks like cheap paper mache done by a first grader. But the artist contends she is the perfect piece for an airport in that she embodies the concept of forward motion and that the 5,000 pound girl is always going into the future going into whatever. Going into whatever could also aptly describe the destination for objects in this shimmering orb at Avalon Park in Stony Brook. Installed in 2016, this so-called interactive art piece or participatory sculpture sits alone in a field of flowers near the park's sky lab, an observatory for both stellar and solar gazing. Visitors can go right up to the orb in a clearing. That's where the participatory part comes in. The Silver Globe is an ultra-modern post box with a slit on its side just large enough to slip in a note to send off to those who have no earthbound address. A nearby plaque explains the purpose of the sculpture, whose Spanish name translates to letters to the sky or heaven. Guests are invited, it says, to send messages beyond our earthly realm, mailing them through this poetic vessel. I can't help but wonder if any of them get returned to send them. I like to end all of my programs with the words of Dr. Seuss. Sometimes you don't appreciate the moment until it becomes a memory. And I like to add, always remember to celebrate the moments and treasure the memories. I hope you've enjoyed your journey around Long Island. If you have any questions about this program, email me or use the contact page on my website. Of course, I also invite you to visit my website to see any of my European destinations. When libraries are again offering in-person presentations, you can check my programs tab to see where I'll be. And remember, that's also where you see the map link of the sites in this video. And of course, visit your library site for more video vacations by Savvy Sightseer. The next time you are tooling around, keep your eyes peeled for some more sites that prompt you to ask, what's up with that? Enjoy discovering.